structure of the presentation, I'm going to begin by briefly setting up the context of the problem of homophobia in Catholic schools, uh, outlining the Catholic doctrine of the matter, because I know that some of you in the room here may not be familiar with what that exactly is, and how the Catholic doctrine informs curricular and policy decisions in the Canadian Catholic school setting regarding uh, sexual minority groups. Next, I lay bare my personal interest in doing this kind of research, uh, motivation behind it. And following this, I describe my uh, recently completed study that we're going to talk about today. It's uh, Holy Homophobia, Doctrinal Disciplining of Non-Heterosexuals in Canadian Catholic Schools. I outline the methods I use to collect data, uh, the validity issues, uh, some fieldwork challenges, findings, and the implications of this study. Finally, I touch upon how this study um, extends into my current research, what I'm currently working on today. At this point, I would like to acknowledge that the uh, intersection between religion and sexuality is uh, not without controversy, given that they're both considered to be highly private matters, yet both are complexly related to uh, social life. And I would like to stress that my research is not about condemning the Catholic faith at all. Um, it is about pointing out uh, small pockets of human rights violations that are occurring in these um, publicly funded Canadian Catholic schools against minority, sexual minority groups. And my point is that this situation is incongruous in a country such as Canada that has respected the world over for the, its Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the leadership it has shown in, in terms of protection of basic human rights. Okay, so when it comes to managing sexual minorities, publicly funded Catholic schools in Alberta and Ontario take their direction from Catholic canonical law rather than Canadian common law. The central contradiction in Catholic doctrine related to the behavior of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer, abbreviated frequently to LGBTQ individuals, who are referred to in Catholic parlance as, quote, persons with same-sex attraction, end quote. That can be distilled down to the colloquial Christian expression, love the sinner, hate the sin. This irreconcilable concept underlies curricular and policy decisions regarding the topic of sexual diversity and the existence of sexual minorities in Canadian Catholic schools. For example, as my doctoral study reveals, contradictory Catholic doctrine on the topic of non-heterosexuality informs curricular decisions, such as the removal the Water School Catholic School District's Board's removal of this book here, um, Open Minds to Equality, because it discusses homophobia. As well as the content of the sexuality component of religion class that students in Canadian Catholic schools must take in order to graduate. Contradictory Catholic doctrine also guides policy decisions on matters such as whether or not this person here, grade 12 student Vianne Iskander, will be per uh, granted permission to establish a bona fide gay straight alliance in her Southern Ontario Catholic High School. Catholic education leaders consult Catholic canonical law when attempting to develop educational policy involving LGBTQ people, including several participants in my study. Participant Narai was fired in 2009 from her position as a teacher assistant in Southern Alberta. After her principal surmised, she was attempting to get pregnant so she could raise a child with her female partner. Participant Joe was fired from his position as a substitute teacher in Northern Alberta in 2008 after revealing that he was transitioning from the female to the male gender. And I know it's really hard for you to see that uh, image on the right there. It's a photo, it's a photo of a, this dismissal letter that he's given. I do have copies of it here in case you're interested in looking at that interesting language in the letter. Um, basically, they, they say that it's contrary to Catholicity to try to change, change one's gender. However, um, there is no actual Catholic doctrine on that matter. And um, the participant Anna was fired from her position as a full-time art teacher in Southern Alberta in 2004 for taking on the role of straight ally to the LGBTQ students in her Catholic school and providing a safe space for them to meet in her classroom at lunchtime. Of the 12 student participants, three who were out about their sexuality to themselves and some of their friends had the disastrous experience of their Catholic school administrators outing them to their parents. Participant Jacob now identifies as a queer trans guy, but back when he was in grade seven at his Catholic junior high school in Southern Alberta, 
He identified as a lesbian. Jacob came out as a lesbian at the age of 12 to a trusted religion teacher who told the principal of the school, who then called in Jacob's parents for a meeting, so Jacob could come out to them at the school. Jacob's parents reacted by sending him to reparative therapy. Can anyone here tell me what that is, reparative therapy? Yes, thank you. Isn't that when you uh, fix the gay, pray away the gay? Yeah, exactly, that's a nice summary, pray away the gay. <laughs> yeah, um, that's what happened to you. The idea that you can become not gay after surgery. Yes. Um, you like to add something? Yes. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, then when somebody enters reparative therapy, usually they choose to enter reparative therapy, and it's not forced upon them. And they should have that choice. Uh, in this case, though, it was forced upon the individual, and um, reparative therapy has been denounced by every reputable psychological association in the, in the Western world. Uh, participant Abigail had such a positive experience coming out as a lesbian in, in grade 11 to her best friends in her Catholic high school in Northern Ontario that she decided to tell a trusted teacher with whom she had bonded over poetry. That teacher informed the principal of the school, who then called in Abigail's mother to apprise her of Abigail's disclosure of her lesbianism. Reflecting on this experience, Abigail says she was definitely not ready to tell her mom, and that it was a terrible time for both her and her mother. While being disciplined for wearing parts of the official boys' uniform with her assigned girls' uniform, namely the boys' tie and shorts, a frustrated participant under the pseudonym Hannah told her vice principal and guidance counselor that she was gay. These administrators of her Southern Ontario Catholic High School decided it was best to call in Hannah's mother so that she could be informed of this. Hannah's mother responded by pulling Hannah out of the school uh, to keep her away from what she regarded to be gay influences at the Catholic school and by eventually expelling Hannah from the family home. Sexual and gender diversity in Canadian Catholic schools pose challenging conundrums. As my study shows, Catholic education leaders' answers to these vexing questions is normally a resounding no. Using Catholic doctrine to fire LGBTQ teachers and otherwise discriminate against queer students in Catholic schools violates the equality rights provision of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This kind of homophobic discrimination is incongruous in a country such as Canada that is considered one of the most socially progressive countries in the world due in large part to its charter and the leadership it has shown in, of the, in, the, in terms of the protection of basic human rights. My doctoral study is a timely exploration of the causes and effects of this long-standing disconnect between Canadian Catholic schools and the charter vis-a-vis -vis sexual minorities. I came to this topic from my own experience as a student and a teacher in Canadian Catholic schools. While I had had a varied teaching career spanning more than 10 years and ranging from international schools in Europe to a small K-12 school in rural Alberta, it was in the Catholic schools where I witnessed the most systemic homophobia. No matter what Catholic school I taught in, I regularly witnessed homophobic jokes or comments on current events such as the legalization of same-sex marriage during staff room conversations at lunch or during meetings. I knew I wasn't going to be able to contend with such an overtly homophobic environment much longer when a promising drama student in a Catholic high school where I was teaching committed suicide in 2004 after suffering several months of bullying due to his sexual orientation, as was confided to me by his friends after his death. Disheartened by how our school had so clearly failed this student, I met with my principal to discuss the duty of requiring all members of the Alberta Teachers Association, the ATA to create a safe and caring school environment for all students. I was told that the Catholic school district does not necessarily adhere to every, every policy of the ATA, and further I was told that our board was developing its own Catholic response to sensitive issues such as uh, homophobia or sexual orientation in Catholic schools. The subtext of this Catholic response does not bode well for LGBTQ people because this usually means maintaining close ties to punitive Catholic doctrine. Our school failed this boy because he did try to seek counseling um, at the school, but clearly did not receive satisfactory results. The gay student's tragic death moved me to take action regarding the Catholic school system's sanction and institutionalized homophobia by engaging in research about it. I resigned from my teaching position 
in order to pursue graduate studies and write away about the ways that some publicly funded Catholic school districts in Canada ignore their legal, professional, and ethical responsibilities to protect all students and to maintain a safe, caring, and inclusive learning environment. My doctoral study uncovers the stories of LGBTQ students and teachers in some Alberta and Ontario uh, Catholic schools through interviews with 20 participants and also through media accounts. And it examines two little known but extremely influential Catholic curriculum and policy documents regarding sexual minorities. One from Ontario called Pastoral Guidelines to Assist Students of Same-Sex Orientation, and the other from Alberta called Toward an Inclusive Community. <coughs> My goal in undertaking this study is to engage in a form of radical democratic politics that examines the state of sexual diversity in Canadian Catholic schools from a specific vantage point and invites dialogue and debate, an important step in making such schools more accepting of sex and gender differences. Such dialogue and debate would never take place, however, if detractors could simply dismiss my study as overly personal, biased, subjective, and nothing more than the self-serving ideology of a lesbian who experienced homophobia in Canadian Catholic schools. To avoid being dismissed in this way, I carefully designed a study that employs uh, specific methods and procedures respected by qualitative researchers for their ability to rule out validity threats and improve the credibility of one's findings. For example, I do upon the procedure of triangulation to collect different <coughs> sorts of data using multiple methods. The point of this procedure is to examine the problem of homophobia in Canadian Catholic schools from more than one vantage point. The advantage of this strategy is that it reduces the risk that the study's findings will reflect the biases and limitations of a specific data source or method and it enables the researcher to gain a broader and more dependable um, understanding of the research problem. By attending to validity issues in a systematic way, I was able to address questions readers of the study might bring to either the design of the research project or its findings such as, how do I know your interpretations or the results of your, of your study are valid? Or since the entire investigation was conducted by one sole researcher, why should I believe you? Well, this study should be believed because of the ample and varied evidence provided by the data. Each of the multiple data sources and methods pose their own unique challenges for, to my fieldwork. Most notable was the difficulty in securing participants. My study employs purpose of sampling strategies to gain the participation of LGBTQ individuals who have had some experience, either as a student or as a teacher, in an Alberta or Ontario Catholic school. In addition to having find LGBTQ Catholic students and teachers from two provinces, my study also sought the participation of LGBTQ youth within the specific age range of 18 to 24. In order to avoid criticisms that the findings of this study are relevant only to one particular region of each province, I consulted geographical maps of the provinces and selected participants from as diverse a range of regions as possible within the provinces. This strategy was useful in demonstrating the powerful reach of Catholic doctrine no matter where the participant resided. Young gay white males were particularly enthusiastic about participating in my study, so much so that I had to turn several away so that other people on the LGBTQ spectrum could also participate. Some non-white lesbians uh, and trans people express a tentative interest in participating in my study, but as soon as I asked them to sign the letter of informed consent, they ceased communicating with me. It seems that once the process started to resemble like, too much of a legal arrangement, some of the more disenfranchised non-heterosexuals seem to be more reluctant to participate. In my interviews with young gay white males, I noticed that unlike the lesbian and trans people I interviewed, Many expressed profound shock at the homophobia they endured, suggesting that this may have been their first brush with discrimination. I would suggest that the newness of their experience with discrimination might account for the greater interest of young gay white males in taking part in a study about homophobia. So now moving on to the findings of the study. All of the participants experienced some form of homophobia in their Catholic schools, 
and Nunn described a Catholic school environment that was accepting and welcoming of sexual diversity. Overall, the teacher participants in the study experienced greater degrees of doctrinal disciplining regarding non-heterosexuality than the student participants. Resistance on the part of teacher participants is less pronounced than that of the students. The similarity of experiences among participants in terms of the heteronormative repression to which they were subjected in the distant provinces of Alberta and Ontario suggests that Catholic doctrine from the Vatican is directing school policy and practice regarding the management of sexual minority groups in Alberta and Ontario Catholic schools as potential hotbeds for homophobia. The Canadian news media have been instrumental in shedding light on various clashes between Catholic canonical law and Canadian common law related to non-heterosexuals in Canadian Catholic schools. The media reports in this study range from important court cases to incidents of homophobic school policies. The court cases show a progression of same-sex legal rights in Canada following the enactment of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, specifically the use of Section 15, the Equality Rights Provision, to challenge discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation in Canadian schools. The media accounts also show a conservative Catholic resistance to the advancement of same-sex legal rights. This particular Catholic backlash is discernible in the appearance of new pastoral guidelines on the topic of persons with same-sex attraction in the early 21st century following the highly publicized advancement of same-sex legal rights in Canada throughout the late 20th century. The homophobic incidents in Canadian Catholic schools described in both the participants and the media accounts chapters of the thesis show that Catholic doctrine on the topic of non-heterosexuality is the guiding principle behind curricular and policy decisions taken in Canadian Catholic schools related to sexual minority groups and sexual diversity. The Catholic Documents chapter examines two important primary texts from the provinces of Alberta and Ontario, written by Catholic bishops and Catholic education leaders, to make clear to Catholic educators the official Catholic doctrine on non-heterosexuality. Both the Ontario and the Alberta texts circulate and endorse the most damning elements of Catholic doctrine that describe, quote, homosexual acts, and quote, as, quote, acts of grave depravity, end quote which are, quote, intrinsically disordered, end quote, and which count among the list of, quote, sins gravely contrary to chastity, end quote. Both the Ontario and the Alberta texts stress Catholic doctrine that calls non-heterosexuals to a lifetime of chastity and celibacy. Both texts subtly recommend the corrective 12-step program called Courage as a reputable resource to assist non-heterosexual Catholics in attaining the goal of lifelong celibacy. The chief finding of the Catholic Documents chapter is that Catholic concept of pastoral care for non-heterosexuals, derived as it is from condemning Catholic doctrine, is not any kind of care at all. The pastoral guidelines on how to manage non-heterosexuals in Alberta and Ontario Catholic schools are not about developing empathy towards vulnerable sexual minority groups, but are instead guidelines on how to perpetuate the Catholic tradition of homophobia in Catholic schools. The chief finding of the uh, theorizing the data chapter is that by analyzing the data collected for the study through the lens of critical theories, it is clear that the Vatican is able to assert a dominant and hegemonic power within Catholic schools. In terms of disciplining the sexual conduct of members of sexual minority groups, the Vatican's power prevails over other governments, such as provincial ministries of education and, by extension, the Canadian government, in the publicly funded institution of the Alberta and Ontario Catholic School. The Vatican's power is panoptic and operates by means of discipline, surveillance, and self-regulation. Although the Vatican's power is clearly a dominant force, it is not entirely successful in achieving total domination over uh, sexual minority groups. This is evident in the instances of resistance that this, the thesis also documents. An important finding of my study is that students are more free to resist the doctrinal disciplining of their Catholic schools than teachers. Students are therefore more likely than teachers to lead the revolution against homophobic oppression in Canadian Catholic schools. Anti-homophobia education efforts should accordingly concentrate on reaching student leaders. For example, 
The story of man is Candor's fight for a bona fide gay straight alliance. At St. Joseph's Secondary School in Mississauga, Ontario, could be transformed into a teaching tool for future LGBTQ students in Canadian Catholic schools who would like to follow her lead. With this new focus on assisting with anti-homophobia education in Canadian schools, EGAL Canada could direct this project, and local pride centers throughout the country could post a link to EGAL Canada's profile on the steps Leanne Iskander took to resist the holy homophobia of her Catholic high school. That is, if Iskander is ultimately successful in establishing a bona fide GSA in her school, rather than the weaker version, known as By Your Side Spaces, an acronym for safety, inclusivity, diversity, and equity, which some Catholic education leaders reluctantly agreed to after much pressure and debate from Catholic students, Canadian human rights and civil liberties groups, the media, and members of the general public. Some Catholic education leaders accept By Your Side Spaces and other general equity clubs in Catholic schools on the condition that they do not have the word gay anywhere in their title, that they are not student-led, and that they focus solely on homophobic bullying among students, rather than the anti-homophobia activism and LGBTQ pride that typify a bona fide gay straight alliance. Since the completion of my study in the summer of 2011, Iskander made the news again in September 2011, this time because the principal of her school threatened her with unspecified disciplinary action if she continues to agitate for a GSA in her Catholic school. Iskander is now pursuing a charter challenge, and I have been asked to serve as an expert witness in her case. Iskander and her fellow students carried on their fight into the 2011-2012 academic year, and they are still vowing to continue with their queer resistance until they have been able to establish an authentic GSA in their Southern Ontario Catholic school. The tremendous transformative power of queer resistance came to fruition for these young queer activists who won a major victory in June 2012 when their efforts resulted in the passing of Bill 13, an important piece of provincial legislation, also known as the Accepting Schools Act. Bill 13 attempts to reduce school-based homophobic bullying by mandating that all Ontario schools, including faith-based schools, must allow to, uh, students to establish gay straight alliance support groups in those schools. Bill 13 includes a notable provision that requires schools to allow students to use the word gay in the name of their GSA. This provision was necessary because Catholic education leaders have been resistant to GSAs, and especially the use of the word gay, and other celebratory symbols such as the rainbow pride flag, because they are considered too affirming of non-heterosexuality. The widespread acceptance of Bill 13 shows that Ontarians recognize that the Roman Catholic Church is not the only authority on Catholic education in Ontario. This current real-world example shows how seemingly powerless individuals, through their tenacity and perseverance in their fight against homophobic oppression, can affect real change. Media coverage of Iskander's fight for a GSA in her Catholic school has the potential to ignite a spark that may encourage Canada-wide discussion and activism in Canada's LGBTQ communities. Catholic teachers, staff, and parents who do not agree with Catholic school policies regarding sexual minorities are increasingly stepping forward to express their opposition to homophobic discrimination in Canadian Catholic schools. The outlook has been grim for many years, but these small pockets of discussion and youth-based activism provide hope that publicly funded Canadian Catholic schools, should they continue to exist, will become actual places of learning rather than sites of homophobic oppression. And I'm just going to tell you now what my current work is about. So Canada is not alone in this problem of how to ensure basic human rights are upheld in publicly funded religious institutions. Conflicts between civil or common law and Catholic canonical law in publicly funded Catholic schools are occurring with growing frequency in the nations of the European Union, North America, Australia, and New Zealand. In keeping with provincial and international trends in education that call for <coughs> an increased social responsibility and greater responsiveness to the rise of globalization, I decided to embark on an international comparative study 
that broadens the parameters of my research agenda by extending beyond Canada's borders into a global discourse of resistance to heterosexist oppression. My current research project, The Catholic Closet, a comparative study of resistance to homophobia in Catholic schools, is a comparative cross-case analysis of Catholic school systems in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom vis-a-vis -vis sexual minority groups. This study aims to uncover the causes and effects of clashes between Catholic canon law and the common law laws of the aforementioned nations regarding sexual minorities. Clashes which are increasingly being played out in Catholic schools. Oppression of non-heterosexuals in Catholic schools is incongruous in nations such as Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, which operate on democratic systems of government that value equality, freedom, and justice. Catholic schools exist in these nations as small pockets of human rights violations, while simultaneously receiving public funding from governmental bodies. This anomaly begs the question, shouldn't educational institutions in receipt of public funding respect the constitution of the land? My current study will provide knowledge and perspectives that will assist Catholic school districts interested in developing policy and practice, practices that are respectful of their legal obligations to safeguard sexual and gender diversity. The Catholic Closet is a project that can facilitate discussion among Catholic education stakeholders across these national boundaries and foster more debate about equitable education for all. Thank you very much for your kind attention and now we can open it to any questions that you may have.